Support comes from Western National Parks Association, presenting a holiday arts market Saturday, December 15th, and a Mexican arts trunk show December 18th through the 30th at the National Park Store. Learn more at WNPA.org. Hello and welcome to Hollywood at Home from Arizona Public Media. I'm Victoria Lucas. Tonight's movie is an offbeat and wickedly funny romantic comedy, The Owl and the Pussycat. It's the film that asks the question, can a couple of bickering neighbors in Manhattan fight their way to discovering that they're actually made for each other? Well, of of course they can, if one of them is Barbara Streisand in her first non-singing movie role. She plays a freewheeling would-be actress who um, turns the occasional trick to pay the rent, while George Siegel plays the guy living next door, an uptight bookstore clerk who fancies himself the next great undiscovered novelist. He enjoys tattling to the building manager about his neighbor's domestic business pursuits, so, of course, they dislike each other on sight. But you know it's a comedy because the more they yell and argue with each other, the more the amorous sparks fly between them. The film was adapted by screenwriter Buck Henry from Bill Manoff's hit Broadway play and directed by choreographer turned director Herbert Ross, who went on to direct Play It Again, Sam, The Sunshine Boys, The Goodbye Girl, plus many other major hits. The memorable supporting cast includes actor-comedian Robert Klein, playing Siegel's pal, who learns that no good deed goes unpunished, and Roz Kelly, who plays Streisand's nutty best friend, before going on to become Pinky Tuscadero on the Happy Days TV series. I'll be back after the film with some behind-the-scenes information about the production. But for now, please sit back and watch what happens when opposites attract in a witty cinematic time capsule that captures the look and spirit of the late 1960s. From Columbia Pictures, it's The Owl and the Pussycat.
Actually, there was only one commercial. You still love me? Who knows? We might even find a place for the television set. Oh, I never watch television. Really? Yeah. It's too damn innovating. Just want to mention in passing There'll be food and drink There'll be moonlight dancing If you could see to it somehow Could you lend your place or a hotel room now? I want to remind you, mind you Now's the time you can celebrate I want to employ you for you just can't wait Just want to mention in passing There's a boat that's leaving here for romancing Let's just leave it to fate now By the end of the 1960s, Barbara Streisand was one of the most recognizable performers in the world, starring on Broadway, the concert stage, and in hit movies. And she had already won Tony's Grammy and a Best Actress Oscar for Funny Girl, her very first film. But even with all the success, Streisand wanted to push herself further to expand her image beyond that of an old-fashioned musical comedy actress. Her funny girl producer, Ray Stark, had bought the screen rights to The Owl and the Pussycats three years earlier and had tried to set up the film with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton in the lead roles. And wouldn't that have been a different movie? But Burton and Taylor ultimately passed, and the script had sat dormant until Streisand, who was under contract to Stark and had recently seen the play in London, expressed interest. The adult themes and language appealed to her more than anything she had done previously. As she told a reporter at the time, I'm looking forward to making the movie so audiences can see the real me, natural and modern. Stark agreed to cast Streisand and then brought her along well-known choreographer Herbert Ross to direct the picture. Ross had only one feature directing credit on his resume at the time, but he had directed Streisand's musical numbers in Funny Girl, and they had worked comfortably with each other. Stark knew that audiences would expect Streisand to sing in any new film, so he quietly asked screenwriter Buck Henry to modify the script to include a few songs. But when presented with the revision, Streisand flatly refused. The whole point, she insisted, was to prove that she could carry a movie without singing. And she was a big enough star that, guess what? She won that showdown. Stark and Ross then turned to looking at leading men to play opposite their star. Rod Taylor was briefly considered, as was Streisand's then-husband, Elliot Gould. But it was screenwriter Buck Henry who suggested George Siegel. Primarily known for his meaty, dramatic roles in Ship of Fools, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and King Rat, but he was also well and truly able to find the humor and irony in whatever character he played. Siegel's rapport with Streisand was instantaneous, and he was always expressed his gratitude to her for helping him understand how to play comedy. Screenwriter Buck Henry, whose credits included The Graduate and Catch-22, had adapted the stage play into a film script that fit Streisand's personality and her strengths. One major change from the play was relocating the story from San Francisco to Manhattan in order to take advantage of Streisand's image. Henry explained, lots of dialogue was written specifically for Barbara's accent and rhythms, her patterns of speech. There was also her sometimes contradictory real-life personality. I mean, she can be very tough and really sentimental at the same time. And that was something Ray and I wanted to use and they had plenty to work with. Even with only a couple of films under her belt, Streisand already had the reputation of being difficult on the set. George Siegel had heard all those stories, but it, it didn't matter. They clicked immediately. And he was so impressed by her performance that he later said, 
There's a reason for all the excitement she generates. She has an unerring instinct. There's no acting. She just is. Finally, the young actress in the silent role of Robert Klein's girlfriend when they're forced out of their apartment was credited on screen as Evelyn Lang in her first feature role. She would go on to change her screen name to Marilyn Chambers and become a star in her own right in movies of a an adult nature. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed tonight's film and that you'll join us again next time for another edition of Arizona Public Media's Hollywood at Home. I'm Victoria Lucas. Thanks for watching. Support comes from Maya Palace, featuring designer fashions, shoes, jewelry, and accessories for all occasions, and personal styling assistance with formal and wedding apparel. Maya Palace is in the shops at Plaza Palomino at Swan and Fort Lowell. Support comes from Friends of Pima Animal Care Center. Pack shelters nearly 17,000 homeless pets a year and never turns away a pet in need. This station's public inspection file may be viewed during regular business hours at 1423 East University Boulevard in Tucson. More meth coming across the border. It's produced in Mexico and then shipped across the border rather than being produced in the United States. The changes that help push drug labs down to Mexico. I'm concerned over the fact that we have so much coming across. Plus, why some are accusing Arizona of voter suppression. For the voters, it's really about access and have open access to, to the voting. All parties are doing their best to reach a, a settlement that you know, possibly impacts all voters. Sunday morning at 11 on PBS 6. Take Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga, put them together, then sit back and enjoy. Thrill to Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga cheek to cheek live on great performances. Sunday at 2.30 on PBS 6. England's Queen Elizabeth is an animal lover. She's always had dogs in her life and horses. It is an all-embracing passion. From her triumphs in the world of horse racing. When she's amongst the racing fraternity, you can see the smile come. To her famous corgis. These rather horrid, snappy little fox-like things. <laughs> it's a unique look at Her Majesty through the Queen's favorite animals. Sunday at 7 on PBS 6. To be a queen, I must rule. Yet to be a wife, it seems I must submit. Whatever trials you may endure, you are the queen. Is there any news of my troops? I'm sorry to say that the worst has happened. Why didn't you tell me? I saw no reason to upset you. Now is the time to attend to your family. What my country needs right now is a queen. Sunday at 8 on PBS 6. The Rogue Theatre enters its 13th year with a provocative world premiere by a local author. It's the story of Celia, a slave, and her journey to break free of her bonds. The Rogue continues its tradition of challenging audiences with deep and soulful theatre. We have this little ritual at the beginning of all of our rehearsals. We throw a ball around in a circle. One of the things that's really cool about that exercise is it's just fun. All right, hold your balls. I beg your pardon. I always tell the, the ensemble that fun is a professional responsibility. Freeze. Hold your position. Beautiful. And move. Joe McGrath and I started The Rogue in 2005. We decided that life was short, so if we want to do the plays that we would like to see, then we should, um, we should just do it. We wanted an ensemble-based repertory theater, and that's what we created. Beautiful. All right, great. You think you got that? We're a very, very strange theater company in that in that we have no sound system in this theater. We've 
really kind of made that a sort of a religious commitment. It forces us to be a lot more creative. Destiny, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go stand up back. And so I want you to talk so I can hear you. That man put mama in a chain. So she was crying. You know? Theater is especially important in 2017 <laughs> because we are very disconnected. We don't have a lot of places for community to come together and experience important ideas and, and talk about important ideas. I'm not gonna uh, lie to you, I was shocked at first. I was like, the rogue is putting on this play. Slave rape ain't a crime. As an artist, I believe it's important to reflect uh, the times in which we live in. Um, I've never done a slave narrative before. I've always been scared, still am right now. I wouldn't be doing it if I wasn't scared. Around up four million of these black savages and, and throw them in. It's really cool just to sit down and not have any physical movement, just verbally hear the language. Some of it is very beautiful from some of the characters and the others are very haunting, as you can see through my face. You take it a knock. Celia the Slave is a play that came to us a couple of years ago, actually. Um, Barbara Seda is a friend who we knew wrote this play, and she shared it with us, I, I think even before it won the Yale Drama Prize. Slaveholder, one of 12 white male jurors on Celia's trial. Great. Even though the play won the Yale Drama Prize, it sat on the table at every major theater in the U.S. for about two years. All those deals kept coming together and falling apart, and coming together and falling apart. Finally, Joe and Cindy invited me into their office and asked if we could do the play here, and I was thrilled. Be done with the troubles of this world. We have an amazing uh, gifted cast that is multiracial and intergenerational. The youngest is 10, the oldest is 70. It may be the last time we walk together. I fell in love with it reading the first monologue, which is Jingo, a hog farmer, talking, just talking about raising hogs. Raising from birth to butcher, bacon, ham, pork chops, smoke butt, fat And butt, talking butt, about it in what are surprising, funny, crude, lively terms. Pop them across the snow. I started in third grade in a show called Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> I was the, the lead role of Beast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing the role of Celia, and she's a very complex character. It's been a roller coaster, I'll say. I think I didn't really realize the weight of the character until, honestly, like, I think the first rehearsal. When I first read through it, I was like, man, this is sad. But when I actually had to feel the emotions that she felt, it, it took a toll on me, not negatively, but it definitely, it changed me and it changed my perspective. The play is based on an 1855 trial of a young black woman who was uh, sentenced to death because she had killed her master after being repeatedly raped for five years. This play is a tableau of interviews with the dead. The salient facts of this story are, are, are all recorded in the, in the trial transcripts. These people actually moment. existed. Fast up, girl! I worked as a journalist for many years, foregrounding the voices of those silenced by the mainstream. She said she killed in self-defense. There are all kinds of reasons that I disqualified myself from writing the play, and then finally, um, I just decided to write it. They ain't gonna vote where I live. They did. They control the government. Because I felt the story was so important, and as a journalist, I always felt not what I have the right to write about, but what do I have the responsibility to illuminate. Free and enslaved blacks are classified as persons with no constitutional protection. White slaveholders do as they please. There's no fear of penalty. Because it takes place in 1855, it's five years before the Civil War, so you can, you can hear the rumblings of the Civil War um, coming through the characters and through the play. That slavery is necessary and barbarous. 
they know there's a reckoning uh, uh, coming, and they're desperately trying to uh, fight against it. Throughout the rehearsal process, um, I at first was really reluctant to get into the character and just into this world because I knew how disturbing it was going to be. But you know, I'm an artist, and in order to be true to the character, to the story, um, and also to the audience, um, we have to get into that. I was bully rag, tortured, accused of killing baby Virgil. My ah! character is really serious. I have to really act the part. Well, Max had a rope around my neck, made it real tight. We talk about it sometimes, and sometimes it just get like a like a dash of anger. Like we like, why did this happen? So like my grandparents or like great grandparents and stuff like that. I just like really get mad at that and how they treated people like that. That she's crazy, spun out. Just like so even thinking about going through as much as she's gone through is terrifying. They've acquired it illegally and intend to keep it all illegally through an illegal legal system. A lot of my white teenage friends, it's hard to talk about. I think. They know about the issues of slavery. I think they're afraid to talk about it. Um, and I was as well. I was as well before this show. Counting the minutes and seconds of their future. That corrupting institution that this country indulged in for, for several hundred years has, has still not stopped corrupting us. I've come to understand our problem uh, better by working on this play. I hope that it highlights the, the collision of realities that existed pre-Civil War, the racist consciousness that existed pre-Civil War that, you know, fed the slaveocracy that became the foundation of American capitalism that is still alive today. We're just really thrilled to be able to present it to Tucson because it's, it's an important work and it's an important conversation for us to have. I'm trying to get as many friends my age as I can to come to this show to kind of realize that it is an issue. More awareness and more invitation to go inside one's heart to heal bigotry, hate, prejudice, discrimination. Don't tell this story. I hope it reminds them that all the, the horrors haven't completely gone away yet. I'm quoting our director, Cindy Myers, who's one of the co-founders of The Rogue. She said, this is probably our most import important play that we've put on yet. Sharing Stars. Greetings, Stargazers. I'm James Albury, director of the Kika Silva Plot Planetarium in Gainesville, Florida. And I'm Dean Regas, astronomer for the Cincinnati Observatory. We're here to help you find your way around the sky tonight. We often talk about identifying stars by their constellation or star picture that they help to form. For example, we would say Betelgeuse is in Orion or Zubinel Genubi is a star in the constellation Libra. But for two stars visible tonight, well, let's just say their relationship status is complicated. First, we'll introduce you to the star Elnath, which connects a guy holding a goat to a charging bull. Then we'll look high overhead for the star Alpharats, which, depending on your imagination, could be the head of a beautiful princess or the backside of a flying horse. Yikes, that is complicated and a little disturbing. Exactly, let's head to the sky. Okay. We have our sky set up for any night this week at 7 p.m. facing east. Sometimes it's hard to identify the pictures in the constellations, so let's look for two shapes in the stars. About one-third of the way up and a little north of east, look for a squished pentagon shape of stars. That is the constellation Auriga the Charioteer. It may be tough to picture a guy rolling around the heavens carrying a baby goat in his arms, but that is exactly what the ancient Greeks saw up there. Now, just above the eastern horizon, look for a V-shape of five stars that can be extended over to the left to two other stars. This is the constellation of Taurus the Bull. It may not look exactly like a bull, but uh, hey, it's better than a Riga over there. 
But look, there's one star that seems to connect the two constellations. That is Elnath, and we better zoom in for a closer look. Elnath is a blue-white star about 130 light years from Earth, and it's huge. It's about five times more massive and shines 700 times brighter than our sun. Can we show Elnath compared to the sun? Wowzers. Now, we have to figure out which constellation Elnath is in, Auriga or Taurus. The name actually is a clue, since Elnath comes from the Arabic meaning the budding. Oh, watch your mouth. <laughs> no, Dean. I mean, the budding as in when a bull runs into something with its horns. Oh, okay. That, that makes much more sense. And astronomers make very definite boundaries for constellations, and so Elnath is officially in Taurus. Now we're going to look very, very high in the southern sky above the red planet Mars, above the moon on December 14th and 15th, you'll see a great square of four stars. And that's what we call it, the Great Square of Pegasus. Ouch, this is giving me neck strain staring up so high. You should lie back in the grass to see this while we fly up for a closer look. Like Dean said earlier, sometimes it's easier to see shapes in the stars instead of mythological creatures. Here we are zoomed in on the Great Square. For now, don't try to imagine it as a flying horse. There's another shape coming off of the square that looks like a long stretched V, but this is not Taurus. It's actually the constellation Andromeda. So to make it easier, let's call this an inverted A for Andromeda. But look, there's a star that seems to connect the two constellations. That's Alpharetz, a blue-white star about 97 light years from Earth. But is Alpharetz in Pegasus or Andromeda? Well, Alpharetz means the navel of the mayor. But when we put the official astronomical boundaries in, we see Alpharetz is in Andromeda. Even though it completes the square of Pegasus, astronomers just decided Alpharetz should go with Andromeda. So check out Elnath tonight in the eastern sky and find its connection between the constellations Auriga and Taurus. And then look high overhead to find the star Alpharats that links Andromeda and Pegasus. I feel sorry for Andromeda. It seems like a very undignified place for a princess. I know, it must be a great honor to have a place among the stars, but still, they couldn't find a better place for her. <laughs> the stories in the stars are weird, wacky, and wild, and you can see them all when you keep, keep looking, looking up. Happy Holidays, I'm Tom McNamara. How would you describe PBS6 and Arizona Public Media? Necessary, fascinating, essential? With AZPM, we all benefit from an endless dedication to honesty, truth, and thoughtful programming. There are so many media options today, and we are honored that you've chosen Arizona Public Media, the station that brings the world home to everyone. We thank you in advance for your support this holiday season and for coming home to the place you trust. By the end of the year, Arizona Public Media needs to raise more than $459,000 to successfully wrap up 2018. Please take a moment to call in your tax-deductible investment to 621-1600 or 1-800-223-7192. If you received a letter from us, please mail in your gift or donate safely online at support.azpm.org. Thanks to your investment, we're building a better Southern Arizona. Your favorite PBS shows, ready to watch when you are. Anytime, any place. Find more ways to explore than ever before.
Lane's Clocks has been serving Tucson since 1965 and offers repair and restoration services for fine timepieces old and new, as well as heirloom and specialty clocks at a shop on Broadway Boulevard, Craycroft. More information is at lanesclocks.com. Support comes from Halili Physical Therapy, now located at 268 East River Road. Dr. Eddie Halili is a neurological physical therapist offering specialized treatment approaches for chronic pain, neurological conditions, and back, joint, and sports injuries. Information's at halilipt.com. The Music Man marches into the Temple of Music and Art for the first time, featuring 76 trombones, trouble, and many more. This classic family American musical performs December 1st through the 30th. Previously on the IT.